Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Perryman. I'm the co-founder of the Kajenga Wellness Project and president of Inferata Center for Excellence, where through our programs and services, as well as educational workshops such as these, we educate the community and provide support for individuals, children, adults, families, couples, as well as support our community. Today, we have a great chat on Black women in the media, as well as discussion around how Black bodies have been impacted over the years through oppression and racism and other difficulties. This is a discussion. It's an opportunity for you to reflect on your own experiences. So there'll be some self-guiding questions throughout the workshop, as well as if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us at info at kajengafamily.org. Let's begin. Before we start, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge um, some people. Again, our workshop today is Black Women Representation in the Media. It is a discussion, it's an opportunity for us to be able to really explore and unpack um, the understanding that our women have experienced over time. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that we're currently situated in Durham region. We acknowledge that Durham region forms the part of the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, Escogold Island, First Nation, and the treaty territory of the Chippewas of Georgina Island, First Nation. It is on these lands that we are privileged and honored to be able to work and to provide you support through our workshops, as well as to live. And this is one of our workshop series. We have many series on YouTube right now. So please subscribe to our channel to always get in box in messages around our channels and our webinars for you. We are proudly supported by the Ontario Trauma Foundation, as well as supported by Carrier Community Health Center. To create change within the experiences of women of color, it's to also consider how our multiple identities impact and influence us. It's important that we seek not only to address and change interpersonal challenges within ourselves, but also know that we're connected to larger cultural, community, and political system, which also impact and influence our lives on a greater level. And that's what we'll talk about today. We'll talk a little bit about Black women in the media throughout our discussion, how Black bodies are influenced within the media, how it then impacts and influences our mental health and how we feel about ourselves and how we can reclaim our identity. I love this quote to sit with you. This analysis of women of color, black women who experience abuse is focused on creating change to meet the needs of this group of people. Throughout history of slavery and colonization, women, black women have been objectified and personified in a manner that has dehumanized their selves and separated their body from their identity. This was written by Bell Hooks in 1989. Their experience of abuse did not just include their body, but also their sexual identity, their spirituality. It influenced their children and more and more within relationships with their partners, within their culture and dominant institutions within culture, such as education system, political systems, all influenced and dominated black women's bodies. But we can create change. It comes with a critical lens of understanding ourselves and understanding what systems are influencing how we feel about ourselves and how women are portrayed within the media and the public. This quote is beautiful. It says, Black womanhood, portrayed as hypersexual by nature, became a stereotype which did not coincide with the dignity of the mother and the wife. And this portrayal continues to reinforce negative stereotypes of black women in the media today. And you see it when you think about the shows that you've watched and the different roles that black women play. 
You know, we're sometimes a supporting role of our white friends or white community members within the show, or we're on videos where we're seen in a hyposexual way. Very little do we see ourselves as mothers, as wives, as, you know, showing that dignity um, that is portrayed in any other cultures and any other women and their bodies. It's different for Black women. And being able to recognize what we see in the media can really help us to then unpack those experiences that we have learned to internalize. You know, as Bell Hooks talks, it is about the separation that happens from ourself. The depiction of Black women as early as after slavery, post-slavery in the 19th century in the media showed women as stupid, lazy, animalistic, irrational, happy-go-lucky, and very simple people. Some of the films they used to have called Blackface Ministry, where people would dress up in Black faces and kind of mock Black people and their identity. And this seems to continue today, where these experiences have been very racist towards Black people. During slavery, Black women bodies was a property of the white male and the white male had the choice to do what they wanted with her, dehumanizing black woman's body and reinforcing that they had no feelings, they didn't have an independent thought, and they actually enjoyed how they were being treated. For young girls, when they see these images, they misinterpret these experiences to believe that they're only as good as their body just to be able to fit in to become accepted and be like, or they feel they need to work harder to disassociate with this belief. So there's almost like two different spectrums. And I'd like you to reflect on Instagram and some of the messages that you see from girls and, and how they may show their body or what they need to do to fit in. Or even young girls who start sending pictures to people of themselves and their body to send a message. All of this stems from these experiences that we see in the media and then which predate to our experiences of slavery and colonization. So what are these images? We know that the negative depiction of black women as domineering matriarchs or exotic sexual beatings was created and still is perpetuated by white, usually male, and even by a few black males trained by the images of hypersexuality and overbearings often merge to symbolize the black woman. So they see us in these lights of the Mammy, the Jezebel, the Sapphire, and this experience is oppression. What we know about oppression is that it consists the way that the dominant group seeks to perpetuate stereotypes and belief that reinforce their privilege and their power. And that goes through the culture and so culture consists of our languages, our belief system, our spirituality, and the practices that are part of the population and critical to how people are socialized within their families, within their communities, and within the world. And so slavery and post-colonization in the modern area have continued to portray these images of Black women and stereotypes that have continued to perpetrate over time. In the 20th century, there were images of Black women seen as domestic servants and caregivers. One author writes, the belief can become institutionalized when powerful individuals create social policy and situations. And what she's saying is that Black women were at one point discouraged from achieving formalized education because they were supposed to fit into this role of the mammy. These images were shaped by the structural inequalities that ex was experienced for Black women based on their race, their gender as a woman, and their class oppression, so their experiences of poverty. There is another um, message or trend that we see where West, an author writes, refers to sexual terrorism as the way that Black women are coerced, they're bribed, seduced, induced, and ordered and violently raped by the stereotypes and the behaviors from the dominant group. 
The Jezebel is a stereotype, was a way to characterize black women as sexually promiscuous and immoral and justified, justified their experiences of rape. These images continued in postmodern culture. When you think of the video vixen from my days in the 1980s and the sexual implicit music videos and images of black women. Another author, Bell Hooks writes that they also found that black women have been objectified in a manner that separates their body from their identity. And that dehumanization becomes perpetrated within other places within their life. And I want you to reflect on this as I talk about these places. And you can think about how this becomes perpetuated. It becomes perpetuated within their relationships. So the relationships with other people, their bosses, um, their colleagues, their coworkers, the culture. So remember we talked about the culture as part of our identity, part of the socialization, institutions like education, political systems, and reinforces dominance and practice. Another interesting area is when we think about is the role of religion obviously has played a huge role in creating this stereotype of black women. And it actually comes with a discourse about um, witchcraft. So in slavery and colonization, the dominant group was Christianity and the way of reinforcing culture and standards and roles for Africans who were enslaved. So they believed that, you know, it was part of God's will for black people to be enslaved. And so then it became a way to buffer against the impact of slavery and provide a source of strength and messages to others seeking emancipation or freedom. So witchcraft was practiced within our culture many years before colonization and was also maintained as a source of empowering black people. But because of Christianity looked down on our religion and who we are, it developed this image of the sapphire woman. So we, so we know right now, as, as I've shared, is the analysis of women is looks in certain ways as being over-sexualized, being aggressive, and dehumanizing their bodies. Creating change is possible. It's, impos it's possible for us to look at ourselves in different ways and different manners, to be objective in the images that we see within the media, within pop culture. But it also comes with having that discussion and this disclosure that we're doing right now and talking about how these systems have been put in place and maintained for centuries. So I'd like you to think, take a moment to think about when we talk about the over sexualization view of women, what do you think of? What media outlets do you think of? What songs connect with that piece? And then what movies have you seen that show that sexualization of women. And think of when women begin to stand up for themselves or to object to the oppression that they experience, they're automatically considered as aggressive. And thinking about the media, what kinds of images do you see about black women being aggressive or black women being wanting to fight or wanting to show their anger and look down upon for doing that. So becoming the angry black woman and then how that dehumanizes women. So then we can't have emotions, whether it's angry or even full of love. Oppression doesn't just occur on the cultural level, it also occurs on that personal level. And it's really founded within thoughts and attitudes and beliefs that show prejudgments about people and it creates a stain of the other. So it looks like black women is the other. We're not part of, we're others. And within that, we also experience the violence 
aversion and avoidance. For Black women, oppression on the, on the personal level has included experience of racial violence, of rape, of standards of beauty that they feel like they don't fit in, a similar aversion to participate in society based on their individual merit and achievement. So they don't even feel that people will accept them and include them based on their abilities. And even when they achieve something, such as being able to direct a movie, they're still being placed into a box or producing movies that look a certain way. These attitudes and belief systems persist and develop a culture where then Black women begin to feel silence. And so self-silence theory is something discussed by Ali and Toner, which refers to women's self-devaluation is tied to the need to express an outer self that is an opposite to their genuine self. And this is maintained by beliefs in the dominant culture and it reinforces those values. So women can't be the true self because if they are their true self, then they will be criticized or they will be looked at differently. But by being our true selves, it really allows us to demonstrate our strength. Without being our true selves, it can contribute to feelings of depression. So since our personal identity is rooted in our beliefs around strength, seeking support for them, mental health would also lead to a distorted view of identity. So think about it. Are you your true self? Are you your authentic self? And when you are your authentic self, do people tell you you're not supposed to be that way? Do they put you down? Let's even talk about skin color because we know that skin color also brings a sense of privilege as well. Another, the very feature of slavery was the development of the hierarchy of beauty and status. And that was used to define people of African people against each other. So people who were lighter skin, had straighter hair, were given more opportunities and privileges within the plantation. And this persisted over time to what we call today as colorism. Research, so actual research shows that darker skinned women have lower salaries, they experience less education, marry less educated men than lighter skinned women, despite the fact that many darker skinned women continue to pursue higher education and demonstrate goal-oriented belief systems. To address these attitudes, many Black women feel that they have to modify their hair, their skin color, even their voices to be able to fit in to the dominant society. And that's another way that we lose our authentic self. We feel that we need to fit in. Black women have been able to do their best to demonstrate these levels of identity formation. But with women such as popular media icons who've embraced oppressed attitudes of sexuality as a way then compromise and generate power to those who are impressed. So it maintains those stereotypes over time. And the fight occurs when black women begin to embrace the concept of the strong black women, which would then play complex roles in their life. Another Im image, and I talked about this in the other slide, is that mad black woman who is also seen as the sapphire persona, as an angry sister with the attitude. And this is influences how anger is expressed and experienced by Black women. In reality, it's just the way that Black women are protecting themselves from underlying challenges mitigated by experiences of racism, victimization, and pain. And similarly, it's a way that they're beginning to form their identity and emerge from the silencing that has occurred by their identity. An important part of liberation began 
the feminist movement. And we know that the feminist movement began in the 1960s and the first wave was focused around liberating white middle-class women from subservient positions within the family. So they, they wanted to be moms, but they also wanted to be more. They wanted to be able to vote. They wanted to be able to hold positions of power and to work outside of the home. And they wanted to be able to have that, those freedoms. And as those wars being granted through court system, through fighting, the second wave of feminism then emerged. And this period is called, you know, anti-racist feminist theory. And it merged because even though the first wave addressed gender, it didn't address race. The presence of racism was still very strong within the feminist theory. And so white feminists saw racism as a moral problem and really want to change the attitudes of individuals who held those beliefs by focusing on the individual. But they really then ignored how systems of racism exist within institutions within Canada. And this came the development of the anti-racist feminist thought, which really is a body of writing that attempts to explain how race and gender intersect with each other. In the analysis of history, anti-racist feminist thought developed for marginalized women resisting the dominant controls in society to a period of women who began to challenge the police, challenge institutions and structures, and also challenge policies such as immigration laws or shelters or other ways that you know, women were experiencing oppression because of their race. So then race, class, and gender oppression were then become interrelated and connected with each other. And by understanding the journey of a Black woman and those experiences, then you can see how the intersectionality of their identities begin to intersect. And so they experience oppression not just because of their gender, their race, and their class. So feminist movement helped to include Black voices with further discussion and further thought. So then we've talked about the experience of oppression throughout society. We've talked about attitudes and stereotypes and beliefs that have been put in place, but let's talk about how that impacts us. So we know that when we're in a situation where we cannot be our full authentic self, and that there is lots of messages around that dominate how we need to be or how we need to act. It can influence how we feel about ourselves. It can influence how we feel about our self-worth and our competencies. It can really impact and influence the decisions that we make and the journeys that we take within our life. It creates traumatic experiences for us as black women, but it also can lead us to make choices that can create trauma within our lives. And then it influences our feelings of ment connected to mental health. So feelings of depression, addictions, and anxiety. The connection between Black people and mental health is very strong. Women can be impacted by mental health in various ways. And there's no difference in terms of the rates of depression that we see but what we do know is that we may experience depression differently. And sometimes it's not just individual experiences that we may experience, but also systemic experiences within our society, within culture, that also can contribute to those feelings of depression. And that leads me to my next thought about race-based experiences. So these race-based experiences really speak to the experiences that Black women have within their jobs, within schools, within their friendships and connections with others, and even within the community at large. And these experiences can really impact and influence how they feel about themselves, as well as their experience of trauma. This is all part of the othering experience. So we're not part of them, we're other. And that experience of other can lead to and feel like those race-based experiences of microaggression where it's more of these 
comments and statements and attitudes that are aggressive towards us. So they're little in terms of how it's presented, but it hurts us very aggressively. Denies the issue. So when we bring up an issue of racism or we feel mistreated, it's a denial. That can't be happening. I'm not racist. I don't see color. All of those experiences deny what the real issue is. There was experience of gaslighting where we're told that something is not happening when we can feel it and we see that it's happening. White fragility happens when people begin to feel, take away um, from the experience of that black person to then talk about how they're experiencing it. And then we see that in the media um, in one show where this one person was talking about, you know, how sad she was that her brother was experiencing racism. And it really seemed to be about how she felt and how she was heartbroken and not really about how he was feeling in that moment. And he said to her as she was crying, it isn't about you. I'm not gonna come in and fix how you're feeling. This is about me. And that's how we see white fragility. It comes up in many different ways, but that's just an example. Surveillance where you're being followed. So you go into a store and you're being followed by the store um, clerks and the assistants or by security officers, or you're driving down the street in your neighborhood and you're pulled over by the police. It's experience to restrictions to access. So there's places in society where you can't go or you don't feel welcome to, and then you feel excluded. The concept of the other, the othering, reinforces white privilege and white privilege creates an assumption which perpetuates the othering of black women and these assumptions are uncomfortable and alienate black women as well as reinforce hostility and violence these assumptions create beliefs that black women should physically present themselves and these assumptions reinforce an older presence or a highly sexualized individual these assumptions also determine oppressive cultural and social characteristics that define Black women. So what other people are defining as ourselves, which is part of that othering. And Black women describes that these experiences of othering create a master-slave paradigm that dehumanizes Black women as a whole. So how does race influence our mental health? As you read through these symptoms, I'd like you to think about your own experiences. You know, which one of these experiences have you had? I'm sure we've had at least one of these experiences. Sometimes it can be rooted within our experiences of othering of race. When black women experience mental health difficulties, it also comes with those experiences of shame and stigma associated with mental health challenges and the lack of resources that are available to treat or address mental health challenges that Black women experiences, as well as there's an intersection between racism and their mental health, and then the impact of the mental health on their parenting skills. So when you think of Black women who have not been able to parent their children because of those serious experiences of oppression that they experience and not being able to parent their children because they weren't well, there is a stigma associated with mental health. Even today in 2021, women have also had experiences within structures that have been oppressive and enhanced their feelings of shame. And this then correlates with an experience of depression for Black women. Addressing these barriers can be very difficult because it's systemic. It's something that happens. It's built in policies. It's built in the structure. And the depression can be impacted by multiple systemic issues. So multiple issues are influencing how people feel about themselves. And it could be oppression, as I talked about, but low self-esteem, having stress, experiencing poverty. 
we know that there is a correlation between you know, racial experiences and grief and loss and the stress associated with death or racism that's experienced at work is then also correlated with anxiety and pain. We also know that Black women experience barriers in assessing treatment for their mental health because of the financial restraints and we need to be able to access clinicians that look like us, that understand our experience. And because many places have wait lists, then there's also that experience of not having the best therapist or clinicians to best meet their needs. And so they go on with these experiences without getting the support that they actually need. Sometimes they're also being misdiagnosed. So no one's even looking at the impact of race, the impact of how people see them or how they're being othered within society. And they just focus on the personal. And by doing that, you miss the opportunity to be able to support them to a larger degree. Does racism, racism impact our mental health? Absolutely, absolutely. And do we need to address it? Absolutely. What does this mean for a mother? What does this mean for us as we are forging a new identity for ourselves? I don't know if you've heard of the term intergenerational trauma, but we know that our own experiences growing up gets passed on to us by our parents, our grandparents. And those experiences that we have then get passed on to our children. And this is important for us to know. So unless we're able to sit back and critically analyze and understand how our identity is shaped by society, by culture, and even within ourselves, and be able to address how race, how the intersection of our gender, of our class, economic status, impacts our sense of self and our identity, then we can begin to unpack and teach our children to understand those connections as well. You know, anti-oppression begins with us being able to look at how these systems work, with us being able to not deny that racism exists, but to acknowledge that it exists and acknowledge that we all take a part in addressing and making change within our community. It's important that we then address how we can support people, our mothers, to be able to address themselves and their roles to be the best moms that they can be and to allow us to be able to find our authentic self, a self that's not defined by other people, by society, by what we see, but being able to choose an identity that fits within ourselves. And that might even mean that we take a stand. We take a stand to identify when we feel uncomfortable with the images that we see in the media or begin to talk about those images and where they can possibly come from and what historical status that those images mean so that our young girls don't grow up thinking that they need to belong into those groups of the Jezebel, the Sapphire, and the Mammy, but they can define their own identity. You know, change isn't something that we can only do ourselves. We have to bring the community and having a community practice is a powerful way to be able to change from within, from changing not just ourselves, but also the community as a whole. And through that capacity and enhancement, we're able to then establish networks of groups of individuals to create community empowerment and to build social change, to change some of those media images. And that might mean, you know, listening to and creating music that truly reflects the multiple identities of Black women. Or we begin to choose and invest in media and movies and shows that show a multiple viewpoints of Black women, of what they look like from skin color to area of 
of background culture to show the richness of their identity and the culture that we exist is so amazing and so great. Through work, through the interpersonal, we can unpack some of those messages that we've learned from the media, from the things that we've seen and begin to really see how we can change those images and how we feel about ourselves. And being empowered, being empowered is something that we do on our own. People can empower us, we can empower ourselves. And it's almost like transferring that feeling of being a victim to a survivor, to be able to heal from difficult experiences and encouraging us to exercise our power. Empowerment practice helps women gain power and access to services using enabling, catalyzing, linking them, priming them, getting them ready to make change. And these methods are so specific to the process of empowering women, especially within relationships that are unhealthy for them. Enabling allows us to, is similar to being efficient and identifying the strength and the ability that we have to be able to bring change within our lives. Linking is a way of connecting us to other women who share similar histories, similar stories and barriers that we're working together. So women's support group is an excellent way of being able to do that. Catalyzing is obtaining resources for women so that they can have those accesses to power and prime them to be able to educate the system about the barriers that exist and begin to, to develop plans to address them. So I'd like you to think about your own empowerment. What can you do for yourself that could help change your mindset from the victim to a survivor? How can you begin to look at the places in your life that you'd like to heal, the values the messages, the belief systems that you hold that can create oppression for you and not allow you to see your true beauty and be your authentic self? How can you connect with women of like mind, like individuals, like ideas and thoughts so that you can be able to work together to bring change within our community? And what are those resources that exist within our community that we can invest in to bring change for our children and our children's children and the community at large? So how do we reclaim our identity? Because there's a point in time where we have to begin to define ourselves, not by the way that we've been othered, but the way that we want to identify ourselves, our true authentic journey. And I don't think it happens today or tomorrow. I think it's a journey. I think as you navigate relationships, as you have experiences, as you work through your profession or your career, as you engage in the roles that you may play as a mother, a sister, a daughter, a cousin, an auntie, all of those places are places where you can build your identity and it isn't a destination. And you're not always gonna be the same person. The person you were at when you're 15 is gonna be different at 20. It's gonna be very different at 30 and it's gonna be completely different at 45 and 50. And so being able to accept that you have a changing dynamic identity that you define, that you decide. So how do we create our identity? We unlearn, we unlearn the messages that we see within the media, within the community that bring us down. We learn to nurture our self growth and change. So we're constantly on this journey of self-growth. We're constantly addressing our mental health, our emotional health, our spiritual health. We're constantly making sure that we're creating balance within our life and we're able to change. We're able to accept that change is part of our journey. Sometimes changes are difficult. They bring us grief and loss, sadness, and even anger. But sometimes change also molds us to be the person that we are meant to be the person that we're meant to evolve into. As I shared before, at one point in life, we were kings and 
we were queens, we were goddesses. We had roles as teachers, as mentors, as mothers, as community members. And through the experience of slavery and colonization, it tried to take some of those pieces from us, from our ancestors, from our grand, great grandparents, but we can reclaim those identities by supporting and developing allyship with other women, we can be able to redefine and recreate our identity. And by using our skills of empowerment, so changing the language from being a victim to a survivor. My five tip rule is self-love. Every day being intentional and demonstrating self-love to yourself. Sometimes it's hard if you've spent a long time looking at images or trying to fit in into images that you've seen. So self-love is, is something that you may need to practice, but that's okay, we all do. And it could be as intentional as looking in the mirror and telling yourself how much you love yourself to doing acts to show self-love, to thinking and being mindful of yourself and how great you are and the great potential that exists within you every day to celebrate you as much as possible and to accept that celebration from others. We know that we're not perfect and that's okay. Our imperfection can make us perfect. Being okay that in life, we're going to have failures. We're gonna have opportunities where we're gonna miss. We're going to have experiences of shame but it doesn't mean we need to stay in that place. It means that as we make mistakes to show compassion to ourselves and to be so kind to ourselves because we got here because of our vulnerability and our vulnerability means that we were courageous and being courageous is living the best life that you can live knowing that you will make mistakes knowing that things won't always go the best way that you hope, but knowing at the very end that you're going to be okay. So as you reflect on this slide, I'd like you to think about how can you show love to yourself? What are those daily affirmations or daily acts that you will do to show love towards yourself? What are you gonna to start to echo in your head whenever you may make a mistake? How do you then celebrate your imperfections and how do you address that anxiety that you feel about wanting to be perfect? How can you show compassion to yourself? What are some daily acts and activities that you can do to demonstrate and show self-compassion and kindness to yourself? How can you be able to give that to other people, to other women that you see, to children and young people? How can you show compassion and self-kindness? Because by being able to do it for other people, you also learn to integrate it and do it for yourself. And what are those brave steps that you plan on taking? How will you be courageous? How will you embrace vulnerability so that you can demonstrate your courage, just part with that is within you? So I thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me talk about representation of Black women in the media and to unpack some of the messages, the attitudes, the belief systems, and the stereotypes that have perpetuated Black women that we see in the media. I hope that this talk and discussion will definitely help you within your journey. Feel free to check out our other videos as well. And again, if you need to reach us, reach us out at info at kajengafamily.org. And I just want to thank you so much for being here with us. And I hope this was an informative lecture for you. Take care. Have yourself a great day.